And I'm going to turn to Acts chapter 3, if you want to turn there with me. Acts chapter 3. Uh, this is where we're going to be tonight. Uh, last week, we began to think about uh, the first sign of a healthy church. Um, we're working through the early chapters of Acts. Uh, and the first sign in Acts 2 was that a healthy church is a spirit-filled church. Uh, in Acts chapter 3, we are, we're thinking about a healthy church as a witnessing church, a witnessing church. Uh, I do pray that you'll be encouraged uh, tonight as we go through this, this chapter. We're going to read the whole chapter together. Uh, it's not very long, uh, and it's a very ex exciting chapter. Uh, so let's, let's hear together the word of God, Acts chapter 3 and verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him as a John and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk, and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us? As though by our own power or piety we have made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaim these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. <clears throat> God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Amen. And this is the reading of God's word. <clears throat> uh, our town, the town of Larne, we seem to hit the headlines for all the wrong reasons. Uh, and uh, we're not usually far from them. Uh, but I don't know if you remember March 2016. Uh, there was a fire engine stolen from our fire station down in the main street of Larne. Um, I don't know if you remember that. It, it was quite bizarre. In fact, it was so bizarre. I had a friend from South Africa rang me up and said, your town has been on our national news. It seemed to make its way around the world. Well, uh, there was two men <clears throat> and uh, they'd been drinking, of course, and then a chip pan had caught on fire. Uh, when the, the fire service dismissed their calls, they decided we'll go down and we'll bring the fire engine to us. So they made their way down Main Street. They walked through the doors. They jumped in the fire engine and the keys were sitting in the ignition. They turned them around and off they went and they caused extensive damage 
in the town, and I don't think uh, they're able to come back yet. Now, the one little detail is is quite interesting. Uh, you know, they jumped into the, the fire engine. The keys were there in the ignition. They were sitting there in the ignition. When I heard that, I began to wonder, well, who did that? Who was responsible for that? But apparently that's true of every fire engine. The keys will be left in the ignition because when it comes to an emergency, it's not just minutes that saves lives, it's seconds, seconds saves lives. Uh, and so the firemen, they've got to be ready to respond as soon as the alarm is raised. If they're not ready, if they're not able just to jump in and go, lives will be lost, lives can be lost. Jesus told his disciples in Acts 1 verse 8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that's, that's our calling. It's, it's a call to be his witnesses, to witness for Christ. We've been entrusted with the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. That news is that there is salvation, there is a rescue, and there is forgiveness. And that's, that's what witnessing is all about. Witnessing is about saving lives, saving lives. So a healthy church will be a witnessing church. A witnessing church will be a ready church church ready to go. If we're not ready, opportunities will be missed. And just like a fireman who's unprepared, if we're not ready, opportunities can be lost. But here in Acts 3, Peter and John, they were ready. They were ready. Peter would write years from this point, always be prepared to give the reason for the hope that is within you. Always be prepared to give the reason for the hope that is within you. And that's where I want to start tonight with two points. And here's the first one. We're to be ready. As a church, we are to be ready. And we're focusing on verses 1 to 11 here. God gives us opportunities to share the gospel. The chapter begins like a normal day. John and Peter, they're in an everyday situation. Verse 1, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. That's an ordinary part of the life of these men. And then in verse 2, they meet somebody who's going about his everyday life. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Every day, this man's carried to the temple gate. And he's there to beg. He's like an institution in that place. In verse 10, we discover everybody knows him. They all know who he is. We have a few characters like that in our time. They're always in certain places and everybody knows them. And this, this seems to be one of those characters. So he's recognized, but he's also despised. Today, our culture uh, goes to great lengths to recognize different disabilities. And so it should. And we try to do all that we can to include and involve uh, these people in, in all sorts of ways. But not then. To the people of this day, this man was pathetic, powerless, an outcast. The lame were among the, the most hopeless in society. Do you remember the parable of the banquet that Jesus told in Luke 14? Uh, one of the last groups to be brought in in verse 21 was the group of the poor, the crippled, blind, and lame. They were the ones beyond hope. In fact, people that regarded this man as a disgrace. In the Old Testament, everything had to be perfect in the worship of God. And so God said to Aaron in Leviticus 21, none of your offspring throughout their generations who has a blemish may approach to offer the bread of his God. For no one who has a blemish shall draw near a man blind or lame. So lame men couldn't serve in the temple. And people took that teaching and they drew the wrong conclusion. Instead of realizing something of God's holiness, which is what was being taught and shown, they drew the wrong conclusion that lame people were people who were cursed and hated by God. And that's how lame people thought of themselves as well. Do you remember Mephibosheth in the Old Testament? He's a descendant of Saul and he's crippled from birth. And David looks him out to show him mercy and grace and kindness. And he describes himself as a dead dog, a dead dog. And that's probably why this man is left at the gate of the temple. He's probably not allowed to go any further. So here outside the temple, beautiful gate, 
beautiful gate is this wretched, shameful beggar. The temple is supposed to be the center of love, uh, the house of mercy, but it's not what it should have been. Jesus had overturned the, the tables in the temple, calling the place a den of robbers. It, it pretended to be a house of love, but it wasn't. Here's a needy man lying outside uh, and they're not willing to help him. But verse four, Peter directed his gaze at him as the John and said, look at us. They're going about their everyday business and they stop and they engage this man. They're, they're different from the people in the temple. They're part of the new people of God, part of the new temple. They're part of the church, the people who truly worship God and they are different. They're ready, they're ready to, to help this man and point him to the healing power of Jesus. You know, a conversation takes place between them and God opens up the opportunity uh, and Peter and John dive in headlong and witness to this man. Peter's ready. Verse six, he says, I have no silver and gold. I imagine the man's heart welting at that. I have no silver or gold. But then he goes on uh, and he says, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He's got something more valuable to give in the name, in the name of Jesus. It reminds us of Psalm 20. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but I trust in the name of the Lord, our God. I trust in the name of the Lord, our God. You know, it's, it's not just a name that we trust in. This phrase speaks of the entire person that's being spoken of. You know, and this is all done in the name of Jesus, the living, ruling, acting Jesus. It's going to be his part that will be displayed in his name. This will be done. And what a, what, a, what a work that's done. What a miracle. Verse seven, he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Now, this man's lame from birth. He's never walked. And you can imagine Luke straining for the right vocabulary to describe what's taking place here. These muscles have never been used. In the next chapter, we discover he's 40 years old. 40 is very, very old. No, I'm only joking. I'll say no more on that. But for 40 years, he'd never walked, never moved those, those legs. And suddenly there's, there's new bones, new muscles, a resurrection of his limbs. You would love this to be on VAR, VAR, you know, up on the big screen in the temple and just replayed over and over again to see this, how, how this all worked and what it looked like. And without having to learn to walk, this man gets up and he does it. You know, we, we, we've been praying as a church for a man in his 30s who uh, was infected with COVID and ended up on a ventilator for eight days. And after eight days, he couldn't walk. He couldn't feed himself. He'd lost all his muscle memory after eight days, eight days. And here's a man after 40 years and he's walking. Look at verse eight and leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entering the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And Jesus Christ demonstrates he's the one who can do what no one else can do. He can work miracles for lame, despised beggars for the shameful and for the suffering. And, and this man now has this new life in Jesus Christ. And he goes with Peter and John and he's in the temple for the first time in his life. He passes through that gate and he can join in the worship. He can join in their prayers with these two Christian men. I don't, I don't believe this chapter <clears throat> is a command for us to go up to Dundonald Hospital and command people to get well. God can perform miracles. He does perform miracles. But this miraculous sign was a sign to authenticate the message Peter's about to preach. In the same way, the miracles of Jesus authenticated his message, pointed to his identity as the Messiah, the promised Son of God. But like the apostles, we are to be Christ's representatives, speaking and acting in the name of Jesus. But I wonder if we're ready, like Peter and John, in an everyday situation, they were ready to respond to the opportunity. There are some things that helps us to be ready. Uh, I'm sure, sure, like me, you can remember moments of real disappointment <clears throat> when opportunities were missed. So how, how can we keep the key in the ignition? 
How can we be ready to go, ready to witness in everyday situations? Well, here, here's a one point. We need to cultivate a missionary mindset, a missionary mindset. You are a disciple maker. We are disciple makers. That's what we're called to do. You know, you, you could be many things. You could be a brother. You could be a, a mom, a grandparent, a son, a neighbor, a student. You could be a, lots of those things together. But whatever you are, above all of that, you are to be a missionary. And all with all the ambitions that we have in life, our greatest ambition should be to glorify God by making disciples in all nations. And we need to cultivate that mindset. And with that mindset, we will be ready to take the opportunities. So we need to cultivate a missionary mindset. And we need to be constantly in prayer, constantly in prayer. Here's Peter and John on their way to pray. They're, they're, they're praying. I'm sure they're praying about the mission Jesus has given to them. Uh, and they've seen a great work and a church has begun. 3,000 people converted one day and they're thinking, there has to be more. There has to be more. And here they go to pray. And we should too, for the people around us, for people in other countries, for people around the world. There, there are fewer things that will shape our minds and prepare us to be on the lookout for opportunities than to pray for opportunities. I wonder when the last time was that you prayed for that, that you prayed for opportunities to witness. So cultivate a missionary mindset, be constantly in prayer and have an eternal perspective. We need an eternal perspective. Jesus is coming again <clears throat> and then the judgment. And as we sing in Christ alone, it will be the hope of heaven or the fear of hell. The hope of heaven or the fear of hell. And to remember that those around us are heading to a lost eternity will help us make the most of those opportunities to speak. Often we let those opportunities pass us by because we're afraid of a little humiliation, maybe rejection, maybe embarrassment. But with this eternal perspective, if we remember the future, well, then we'll realize it's worth losing some reputation. It's worth losing some friends. If by speaking, I might snatch some from the flames. If I might snatch some from the flames. Whether people are talking about family or health or going to the hairdressers on Friday or COVID restrictions, we can find opportunities to share. Before we move on to the next point, uh, I've just been thinking about a man, Gareth Crosley. Gareth Crosley is an English minister. He came over to Balamoney uh, when we were teenagers and he did five nights <clears throat> speaking in the church. I can remember one of those nights quite clearly. I can't remember the others, but something I do remember very, very clearly is when we went to Tesco's. And we went through and we're standing at the till and shopping's being passed through. And the girl who was on the till took the Lord's name in vain. Uh, and without reverence, she said, good God, good God. Uh, and Gareth Crosley just looked at her and he said, you're absolutely right. She looked up, quite taken aback and said, what? There is a God and I know him and I can assure you he is absolutely good. And there was a conversation that followed. Just that little slip uh, of taking the Lord's name uh, in vain by, by this girl. He seized the opportunity. He was ready. I wonder, are you, am I? We need to be ready. Well, Peter was not only ready to seize the opportunity, he was bold. That's the second point. He was bold. <clears throat> and we need to be bold too. This, this encounter with the beggar wasn't the only opportunity that Peter had that day. So the excitement of the healed beggar drew the excitement of an astonished crowd. And in they gather to see what's taking place. Now, we, we, we are to be ready for the opportunities, but we're to be bold as we use those opportunities. Notice what Peter says, verse 12. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we made him walk? Isn't that great? Why, why are you astonished as if we did this? You imagine, imagine you're in a coffee shop. Uh, and your friend is in trouble, <clears throat> and you're listening, and you're chatting, and then your friend turns around and says, look, thank you, thank you so much. Your advice is always so helpful. It's always so helpful. If you were Peter, do you know what you would do? You'd be bold, and instead of saying you're welcome, and just going a bit red, 
you appoint your friend to Jesus Christ. So when he says your advice is always so good, you say, well, look, can I tell you why that might be? Why my advice is often, is often okay, is often right? It's because I've learned that relationships are messy. But no matter how messy a relationship is, it's never beyond restoration. Because that was like me. I was an enemy of Christ. That was a messy relationship. But he came in love to restore me. And that's where my way of thinking, that's where my way of life comes from. Do you want to know more? And that's what Peter does. Here he is, people coming and they're astonished at Peter and John. And he turns the attention away from himself and to Christ. He's bold. Look at what he says. He starts talking, first of all, about who Christ is, who Christ is. In verse 16, <clears throat> now we're going to be jumping across the verses here so you can just gaze down. I'll not read them all out. But verse 16, he speaks again about this name, Jesus. You know, Jesus means God saves. In verse 13, he calls him God's servant. Uh, Isaiah 53 talks about God's servant who will be pierced for our transgressions. In verse 14, <clears throat> he calls him the holy and the righteous one. Now, only God is holy. Only God is righteous. So who is, the, who is Christ? What's his identity? God of very God. Verse 15, he's the author of life, the author of life. Life originated with him. He's, he's the creator. So he's the one who has the right to tell us how we should live. In verse 22, he's the one that Moses predicted in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. The great prophet that God promised to send. In verse 24, in fact, he's the one all the prophets talked about, the one all scriptures pointed to. In verse 25, He's the source of all blessing as the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham way back in Genesis chapter 12. And you, you could build a sermon on each of those verses. Who is Jesus Christ? Because it's rich and it's full. This is Lord Almighty, the creator God, who came to suffer and to save, to save. That's who this is. And when we're sharing the gospel, people will try to, cause us to run down all sorts of rabbit holes uh, and come out with all sorts of questions and clever arguments. But we need to remember that while we try to address those, those questions, the thing that that person needs most is to see who Jesus is, to see who Jesus is, that we need to take them to Jesus. We need to be bold in that. Sometimes we're very gentle, gentle, and uh, they ask a question, we're halfway through and answer another question, and another question, and another question. Hold on. If you genuinely want to know what this is all about, let's go back to the first question because Jesus is key to that. Do you want to, we need that boldness. He's the glory of heaven. He's the Lord Almighty. He's the power of the kingdom. He's the gospel. So he's bold. He texts him to who Jesus is. And then he texts him to what Jesus did. What Jesus did. He shows them what he did. He, he died on the cross. Verse 15, you killed the author of life. You killed him. You're responsible for rejecting Christ and his death. And that's bold, isn't it? He's so direct. People need to hear this today. They need to hear that they can make amends with the God that they have defied. Not by being decent people. If that was true, if we could, Jesus wouldn't have had to go to the cross. There would have been another way. God wouldn't have said no to Jesus prayer, take this cup from me. The very fact that he did die shows that we're totally, completely alienated from God, unable to do anything to save ourselves. And so he has to die. He died. And then he rose again. In verse 15, you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. It was impossible for the grave to hold the author of life. God raised him from the dead. God vindicated him. We we're thinking about this on Easter Sunday, as I'm sure you were. He really is the son of God. His work on the cross was truly accepted by God. And here's where our confidence is found. He was raised to life. And Jesus is graciously working today in the healing of this beggar so that you who murdered him can see that he is truly the servant of Isaiah 53, who died for your transgressions. He died, he rose again, 
and he will come again. Verse 21 it talks about heaven receiving him until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. God's glorified him. <clears throat> he has ascended into heaven at his right hand, but he's coming back. He's going to mend this broken world. He's going to bring a new heaven and a new earth. At that moment, uh, at, at this moment, he's in glory. Until that moment, when it's the restoration of all things. What a great day there is ahead. And this is who Christ is and what Christ did. And Peter is showing us if we're going to bear witness properly, we have to exalt the name of Jesus, who he is, and his mission, what he did, including the fact <clears throat> that one day he's coming and every knee will bow and every tongue confess he is Christ the Lord. But he also speaks about what Christ demands, what Christ demands. You know, look at verses 14 and 15. Verse 14, but you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. You remember Barabbas? And they said, release Barabbas, release Barabbas instead of Jesus. They chose him, a murderer. And Spurgeon reminds us at this point, every sin in its essence is killing God, a killing of God. You know, if we live for sin instead of living for Jesus, we're choosing murderers instead of the living Christ. It might be alcohol, it might be drugs, it might be gossip, it might be greed, it might be some other sin. <clears throat> but whatever it is, it's going to lead us to death. It's going to lead us to eternal judgment. And so there, if we're choosing sin over Christ, we're, we're choosing a murderer that will kill us. But there's a way to forgiveness. And here's what Christ demands. Repentance, repentance. Look at verse 19. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. And that's bold. That's not a suggestion. He commands them to turn from sin, turn from that murder, and turn to God. That's repentance. Verse 26. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Isn't that amazing? God will bless those who crucified his son, who murdered his son. And surely he will bless us if we repent, if we repent. So he speaks about what Christ demands, who Christ is, what Christ has done, what Christ demands. And then lastly, what Christ gives, what he gives. I will blot out your sin. Think about the things we've done in our lives. Things we really regret and that we feel to our shame. What does the gospel do? It washes those things away completely. Total forgiveness. Verse 20, I will give times of refreshing. He'll give us the Holy Spirit. He gives us new life. He gives us purpose and joy. I will give a glorious future. You know, it will be with, with him one day. When everything's restored in the new heaven and the new earth, we'll be there. And this is the greatest news ever, isn't it? You know, who Christ is, what he has done, what he demands, and what he gives to those who respond to that demand by repentance. The best news ever, the news of Jesus Christ. And no wonder Peter is bold. No wonder he's bold. And we're to be bold in the same way with this news. And maybe tomorrow, and maybe this week, you'll get an opportunity to witness to someone. Well, don't, you have that expression, fitter, don't fitter about. Seek to get the Christ and boldness, get the Christ. And the world needs to see who he is, what he did, what he demands and what he gives to those who meet that demand to repent. If, if we do make the most of the opportunities, there will be success, but there will also be suffering. There will also be suffering. If we're a church that has this healthy mark about us, that we're a witnessing church, we're prepared and we're bold in that witness, we'll see success, but we'll, we're also promised suffering. And that's what we see in chapter four and verses one to four. I'm finishing here. Luke tells us about the Sadducees, the priests, the captain of the temple. They come and they seize Peter and John. They arrest them and they take them away. And we should expect that. We should expect suffering. We should be prepared not only to witness, but for ridicule and rejection. Peter and John are in prison for their readiness and their boldness to speak of Christ. 
but they don't sit in prison saying, ah, Peter, I wish you'd kept your mouth shut. I wish you had just knew when to held your wish. No, they, they're blessed. Chapter four, verse four. But many of those who had heard the word believed and the number of the men came to about 5,000. That's the number of people in the church. 5,000. It was 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. Now another 2,000 are added on this day. And they're willing to suffer, Peter and John, if they might save some for eternity. They're willing to put themselves in chains if it means some of those enslaved to sin might be set free. You know, there will be some suffering, but there will be success. Opposition and rejection can't stop the spread of the gospel. It'll never hinder the word of God. And so I want to ask you, are you ready? Are you ready? I'm asking this to my own heart as well. Do you have the key in the ignition? Are you ready to go? Ready for the opportunities tomorrow, this week? And uh, when those opportunities come, will you turn the conversation around in boldness to Jesus? And are you prepared to suffer? Because you might be called to do that. But you might also be left rejoicing because there are many of the harvest to be gathered in. We've got to be ready to boldly speak the message. We can't just expect people to, to find us online or to come into our services and join us. We need, we need, wherever we are, to be a missionary. Our responsibility is to hold the gospel out to our communities and around the world. And so we need to be ready and bold in the task Christ has given. Let me, let me pray and then I'll hand back to Justin. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we do pray uh, that you would help our hearts to receive your instruction. Uh, and we do pray that we might uh, know this cultivation of this missionary mindset and that we would be constantly at prayer with an eternal perspective uh, that would have us going out to our workplaces or to, uh, to see family or to talk to friends or to send messages or to go onto our Facebook page with, with an attitude that's ready to in boldness proclaim Christ. And Father, we do pray for opportunities and we pray for the leading of your spirit and we pray for your word to go out and we pray it would continue unhindered and that we might see many saved and brought into new Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.